thing I, that you know I do different here than when Russ is here is I'm going to ask you to participate. So if you could put that up on the board or on the uh, screen rather, Jim. We're all going to say a declaration together. If you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to lift it up with today. If you don't have your Bible and you have a phone, you have it on the phone app, please lift up your phone or, or your tablet or whatever you have it on. And if you don't have either, would you just place your hand on your heart? Because how many of you know that you might be the only Bible that some people ever get to read? And we're going to say this declaration together. This is my Bible, God's holy word. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do all it says I can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Whew, got a little winded coming up here. Hey, I have to tell you, so we are going to continue in the book of Mark. Uh, 16 chapters, 16 weeks, we're going to go through it. And uh, when Russ told me that uh, he was going to be gone and told me he wanted me to do these chapters specifically, it was interesting because had he told me I was only going to do one of these chapters, I probably would have given a totally different message. But man, I'm still winded. I'm out of shape. But, but here's the thing, when I read these two chapters together, they go together. And that's why next week is the continuation. It'll be, so this week we're doing chapter seven, but we need to do a little background first. You see, people, I, I've watched a lot of videos and a lot of interviews and everything, and there's a lot of people, outsiders, don't understand the Gospels. We have four Gospels. Now, most of you grew up in Sunday school. Most of the world hasn't, so they don't know these things. And a lot of people say, well, they contradict each other because they talk about different things, and they don't. In fact, um, we could, I could go into detail about how experts have said that actually they fill in gaps, they prove each other right because they're not exactly the same. So, but I want to talk a little bit about that. You see, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, as you know, Matthew and John were direct disciples of Jesus Christ. Matthew was a tax collector, so he was very meticulous, very analytical in the way he wrote the book of Matthew. Now, John is an interesting character because this is the only book in the Bible that we ever hear John referred to as uh, the one that Jesus loved or the Jesus beloved. It was as if he was saying, I'm his favorite. <laughs> Luke was a physician. When you read the book of Luke, you see how he dissects everything that he talks about, kind of like a doctor would. And then there's Mark. When Russ told me that he was going to do this on Mark, I told him right away, I said, good. I said, I relate to Mark. I understand Mark. See, Mark, the author of Mark was a man named John Mark, and he was an outcast. Mark was a, uh, John Mark was a disciple of the great Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul wrote most of the New Testament. Here's the problem, though. They kind of had an animosity towards each other because John Mark was not the typical student. He was not the cookie-cutter version of what you would think of as a student to be. He didn't learn the same way. He didn't do the same things. He didn't take the same approach. Ms. Simpson, you ever had that problem with students in school? <laughs> You're looking right at them. But <laughs> however, at the end of Apostle Paul's life, when he was literally on his deathbed, he said, send word to John Mark. Let him know how important he was to me, what a benefit he was to me. Let him know how, how useful he was to the gospel. That's what it meant to be. So now as we get into chapter 7, here's the thing. Up until now, chapters 1 through 6, is Jesus has been laying a foundation. Things have been kind of going pretty well. He's been performing miracles. He's been healing people. He's been casting out demons. But now we're getting into a transition. Seven and eight are the transitional chapters. We're going to get into chapter nine when Pastor Russ gets back, and that's when it gets ramped up because then we're going to start moving towards the cross, and it'll be noticeable. But going into chapter seven, here's what happened. Here's where Jesus is at this point as we get into this. His own family, his friends, the ones in his hometown that he grew up with that knew him probably better than anyone, didn't believe in him. They still looked at him as just the son of a carpenter, like nobody. They even had, when he started proclaiming the gospel, when he started going around preaching, when he started doing these miracles, they actually had an animosity towards him, a bitterness. They started bad-mouthing him, belittling, and even gossiping about him behind his back. On top of that, his own cousin, John the Baptist, had just been executed. They had his head cut off and put on a platter. And then what I personally consider the saddest passage in the entire Bible, 
because Jesus didn't just have his 12 disciples. He had a bunch of followers that went everywhere he went to. And when they saw, they had just seen Jesus feed the multitude, the f- over 5,000 with, with miracles. And then, and then on top of that, they just witnessed him walk on water. And they saw all these things that he was doing and they believed in him right up until he said, I am the bread of life. No one gets to the Father except by me. At that point, they realized he wasn't what they wanted him to be. And the passage that breaks my heart is it says they left him and they followed him no more. Folks, they were so close. They were right there and they missed it. So we get into chapter 7. I'm going to start at verse 1. And I'm not going to read all of it because we're going to do that tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock in the green room if you want to join us for Bible study. We'll also be live online. Verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law, that's important, who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled. That is unwashed. This is where in my notes it says the whole congregation had a gasp. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating with their food defiled hands? This is where it gets good. Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. It is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Jump down to verse 13. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and he said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside of a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of the person that defiles them. Folks, you know the only requirement to attend church is to be a sinner? I, want, I should stop there because I need to make a big announcement here. In case you don't know, uh, our uh, superintendent, uh, Edgar uh, uh, Brady, has been moved, and we have a new superintendent. And I need to let you know that next week he's going to be here, and he's going to preach. And it's, you're going to be excited because he's going to talk about the future of the church. And, uh, and if, uh, Jim, can you put that picture up? This is the Reverend J. Roll. Some of you are laughing because you figured it out. I'm spoofing you. That's, that's not the, our new superintendent. This is actually a singer named Jelly Roll. He goes by the name Jelly Roll. And uh, somebody said, cool. But hey, but I wish he was coming next week. But I wanted to tell his story because Jelly Roll's testimony, believe it or not, fits today's message. Because Jelly Roll, in case you don't know, has the number one song in the nation right now. He talks about how he's not worthy, how he's not good enough, how he needs God, how he's telling people, don't follow me, follow God. That's the message in the number one song in the nation right now. Jelly Roll, most of his life, was a drug dealer. In fact, he was a very successful drug dealer, and he spent most of his life in jail. And on top of that, he said, I actually liked jail. I had no problem with jail. I would do what I had to do when I was out, and then I'd go right back in, like nothing changed. I knew all the guards, I knew all the other prisoners, I liked it. He said up until he found out that his wife was pregnant. And he said right then and there I realized I can't bring a life into this world living the life I'm leading now. So he said he had to change. But then he realized he couldn't do it on his own. So in his jail cell he cried out to God and he says, you have to save me. I can't do this. He got a Bible and started reading it nonstop. He told his wife, he says, hey, go find us a church because when I get out we're going to start going every week. But here's the problem. Then Jelly Roll found out that when his wife would go to every church that she tried to find, which is a good church, she wasn't welcome. They let her know 
we don't want your type here. Do you imagine that? She must not have come here. So, however, Jelly Roll got upset and he said, wait a minute. He said, here's the problem. He goes, because the Jesus I'm reading about in the Bible is not the same Bible, they're pre- is not the same Jesus they're preaching about in church because the Jesus I'm reading about in my Bible says that I'm the kind of person he would go hang out with. I'm the kind of person he would look out for, the kind of person he'd go looking for. I'm the kind of person he wouldn't go, hey, Jesus, he goes, I hate to tell you, Jesus wouldn't hang out in some stuffy church where people were all righteous and they weren't doing anything wrong. He goes, because the Jesus I'm reading about was a friend of sinners. He didn't condone, he didn't partake, and he didn't uh, uh, have a part of what they were doing. He didn't condone that, but he still loved me. Jelly Roll was all upset about this. You know, Jelly Roll now goes to concerts and he glorifies gods in these sold out arenas. Jelly Roll goes to prisons and puts on, he sings his own songs in these prisons. And it's, if you watch the videos, go on YouTube and watch the most amazing thing you'll see because here's guards and prisoners together with their arms around each other singing Jelly Roll songs. And they said that it just turns into a praise and worship session. Jelly Jelly Roll goes to drug rehab centers and tells people how they, he gives them hope. He says, I made it, so can you, don't miss it. Jelly Roll, in fact, earlier this year, spoke in front of the United States Congress, and he told them about the problems and, the, and the, the, just how important this drug epidemic is. And he said, here's the problem. He goes, I'm the last person in the world that should be up here talking to you about it. And yet, why is it left up to me to do it? Because he didn't miss it. I want you to do something here for you. I said we participate a little bit. Look to the person to the right of you, and then look to the person to the left of you. Now, maybe there's not someone next to you, and maybe you just saw the back of someone's head. But I guarantee you saw somebody here today. And I want you to tell, I can promise you one thing about that person. They're struggling with something today. It could be an injury, it could be an illness, it could be a heartache, it could be a heartbreak. They could be living in fear for themselves or for someone they care about. They could have any kind of addiction. They could have regrets. They could be feeling unwelcome no matter where they go. They could be uh, holding on to some kind of bitterness or resentment. And here's the thing, to you, whatever they're struggling with might mean nothing. But to them, it might be the biggest and scariest thing they've ever had to face. And if that's you here today, I want to share this with you. God makes two promises. The first one, he says, this too shall pass. And here's the other promise that goes along with it. He promises that until it passes, he'll never leave you or forsake you. But what about those people that they just keep doing bad and nothing bad happens? What about those people that just have that blessed life? What about those people that you look at them and say, why am I struggling and they're not? Why me, God? Here's something I heard, and it's, it's all too true. Sometimes the devil allows us to have a life free from trouble because he doesn't want us turning to God. Sin is like a jail cell, except it's all warm and cozy. There's no reason to leave. The door's wide open, but we stay there until one day it's too late. And the cell door slams shut. And there's nothing else we can do. You know, in verse 6, he says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Now, a few weeks ago, uh, when we had Christmas Eve service, Russ joked, if you were here, he joked at the very end because he said that I threw a temper tantrum about how we always finish by shutting down the lights and we always sing Silent Night and then, then we just walk out quietly and that's it. He wasn't joking. I literally did throw a fit. I threw a temper tantrum. It was not pretty, folks. And here's the thing, and and I'm not embarrassed about it, because how can, on the most holy night of the year, when our Savior was born, how can I stay silent about it? And we can, here's the problem with our traditions. Sometimes they become human traditions. A little background. What we consider church, when we look down the itinerary, the breakdown of how a church is handled and what we do, and we do this, and then we do this, and then we do this. Guess what? Here's a couple things. I read the Bible. 
There's no pipe organs. Sorry to offend you. There was no stained glass windows. There were no hard wooden pews. But you know what? There was a lot of things like jumping and shouting and raising hands and clapping hands and rejoicing. A lot of things that we consider very solemn occasions, they considered festivals and celebrations. There was a lot of that going on. It's funny because we call this the contemporary service and 11 o'clock the traditional. And I'm not trying to offend anybody. I honestly am not. This is the traditional service when we raise our hands and clap and when we're praising God with all we have. It's what's in our heart. He doesn't care about what's on our lips. But here's the first, uh, there's a man, here's my first point. I have three quick points. There was a man named D.L. Moody. I don't know if you've heard the name. Maybe you've heard of D. Uh, Moody College. There's a lot of books, lots of uh, uh, tools that he gives out. D.L. Moody tried to go to seminary and he failed the exam. And yet, D.L. Moody is one of the most successful evangelists that's ever lived in the world. D.L. Moody once preached in front of an arena of over 130,000 people. He was at a church conference with all these religious leaders from around the world. And they're in this little room and that had a window looking outside. And they all asked him, they said, how is it you are so successful? How is it you, an uneducated man who's never been to seminary, has so much success when it comes to speaking about God? See, Dion Moody simply said, look out the window and tell me, describe to me what you see. And one by one, all these important religious leaders with these big names and big credentials, and they all explained, well, I see this person and they're wearing this, and I see this person, they're doing that. And after all that, they turned around and looked at Moody with tears running down his face. And he said, I'll tell you what I see. I see countless souls who are going to die and go to hell because they're desperately in need of a Savior named Jesus. That was the difference. That was what was on D.L. Moody's heart. You know, they tell, say, um, in, uh, you, you can tell anything you want to know about a person within the first five minutes. I can meet you for the very first time, have a five-minute conversation with you, and tell you everything I need to know about you. You know why? Because Matthew 12, 34 says that out of the heart, or out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever's on your heart is what you're going to talk about. And I got to ask you, what's coming out of our hearts or what's coming out of our mouths? Are we, when you get in a conversation with someone, are you, can you not hold back? Where's Blondie at? I know she can't, yeah, Blondie can't stop talking about God no matter who she meets. I know Melanie, she'll start talking about the chosen, she'll talk about God, she'll talk about anything with the Bible. It's, you can't stop yourself what you're going to talk about. Are you constantly building other people up, edifying them, uh, encouraging them, even if they're total strangers, even if they're people that can't help you in any way whatsoever because that's what's in your heart? Or are you the other extreme? Do you, when you get into a conversation, do you find yourself maybe, this is going to hurt some people, gossiping? Do you find yourself maybe bad-mouthing people behind their back? Do you find yourself saying offensive things? Do you find yourself saying words that maybe you shouldn't say? And you know what? Here's the thing. When it comes to spiritual maturity, here's a sign of spiritual maturity. It's not simply that you don't do those things because, folks, I'm guilty of this. I'll find myself saying, well, I was thinking it, but I didn't say it. Well, that's good that I acknowledged I was thinking it instead of saying it, but I'm still thinking it. That's still in my heart. That's something I still need to purge. But you know, here's the thing. If you're in that, that should make you uncomfortable. If you're around somebody that's gossiping or bad-mouthing somebody, maybe stop them for once and say, hey, wait a minute. Instead of bad-mouthing this person, instead of me joining in, and why don't we pray for this person? If you're bad-mouthing me, which I, I don't blame you, I'm going to tell you, why don't you stop and pray for me? Because obviously I need it then in your eyes. So I'm going to say that. But... There's something called, uh, you ever heard the expression, hurting people hurt people? When you hear someone bad-mouthing you, maybe stop and think, why are they bad-mouthing me? Is it because is I'm bad or maybe, maybe they're going through something? Maybe I need to pray for them. Jesus said, pray for your enemies. This is what he was talking about, folks. You know, um, second point. The conflict that the Pharisees had wasn't over Scripture. and It wasn't over commandments. It was about tradition. Pharisees had a problem with Jesus because he didn't fall in line with what they wanted. The Pharisees were basically the cancel culture of their day. It wasn't about truth. It was about believing and behaving the way they wanted him to. And if you didn't live according to that, they were going to cancel you. 
in Jesus' case, literally, at least they tried. You know, it's, but it's, uh, here's the thing about when I, it's, I'm not making fun of traditional serv- folks. I grew up in very traditional services with pipe organs and with uh, the hymnal books and, and we had all of that. And I have to tell you, the first time I ever experienced a more contemporary worship, a praise and worship service, when I saw drums and guitars, I was all the way on the other side of the world. And when I walked in and saw that, I thought, where's the pipe organ? That was my first thought. My second thought, when the music started, I thought, oh, you people better stop or God's going to get mad because I just didn't understand but it progressed on from there you see we can I've been to praise and worship folks I have been to these traditional services where it's just hymns and it's just liturgy and there is more spirit of God there than there is full-blown praise and worship where people are jumping around and everything because we can get too used to it who can become the other night if you were here for ash uh, wednesday service uh, we were here and we sang a hymn and i remember um let me back up just a little bit you see i was in the air force and when i went to basic training before they let us go in uh, for breakfast first thing in the morning we had to sing the air force song now if you ever heard the air force song it's a beautiful song especially when it's song right and a bunch of men are singing it really loud i mean it's just it's just beautiful but then Imagine a bunch of 18, 19 year old kids that are like well before the sun's up, trying, just want to go in to have breakfast with their bad morning breath, and it's off we go into. I mean, it was horrible. I can't, even as bad as I sing, I can't even make it sound as bad as it was. But here's the thing the other night when we were singing that song, and we started singing, and I'm sitting right down here in the front row, and all I'm thinking is off we go. And then all of a sudden, Lynn stops. She's playing the piano and she says, wait a minute. And she just stopped it all of a sudden. And I don't know what you did, Lynn, because you're a musician and I'm not. You changed something and all of a sudden it lifted everything up. And it wasn't just the the quality of the music. It was like the whole spirit of the church lifted. And the song just all of a sudden started blaring out with everyone that was here. And I hope you were a part of that. But here's the thing. The tradition itself wasn't the issue. What these Pharisees were doing with it, it's what they were doing with it. They used it as a mask of righteousness. Their traditions distracted them from what God actually wanted from them. They deceived themselves and they deceived others into believing they were right with God when they weren't. And folks, that's a dangerous place to be. And before we go on making fun of the Pharisees or saying, well, at least I'm not like them, let's stop and think maybe how much we are like them. You know, because it's a very, Jesus, when he was describing this to his disciples, he wasn't just making fun of the Pharisees. He would, no, he was warning his disciples and he was letting them know there's a very thin line between them and you. So be very, very careful of where you tread. The third and final point, Jesus was desperately saying, you're missing it. Don't miss it. Being a follower of Jesus means you follow Jesus. To love the things that God loves and to hate the things that God hates. That's why we get into the Word every day to find out what God loves and what God hates. Folks, we can't do this on our own. Let me make this very simple. Our goal is not simply to avoid sin. Our goal is to be close to the Father. You know, there's a Movie, one of my all-time favorite movies is called Field of Dreams. And if you've seen it, you're going to understand that I can't possibly say as good as this movie is. And if you haven't seen it, I don't know if we can be friends. But <laughs> Kevin Costner is the main star in this movie. And in the very beginning, he's, he's talking. And he's talking about how uh, his father and growing up with his father and how all they did was bicker and fight and talked about how they didn't get along and the animosity between them. And he talks about when he was old enough, he left home and he went as far away from his father as he could. And then all of a sudden, now that he's the same age as his father was when he thought his father was an ancient old man at the ripe old age of 36, all of a sudden this voice tells him to do some crazy things. He has to build a a baseball diamond in the middle of the cornfield. And then all of a sudden he has to travel around the country and, and meet all these different people with all these different issues shoes. The whole time this voice is telling him, ease his pain. And he's trying to go around helping all these different people to ease their pain. And at the very end of the movie, spoiler alert if you haven't watched it, all he wanted to do was be with his father. At the very end of the movie, he got to be with his father. And that's all he wanted. It was his pain he was trying to heal, to be close to his father. Mackenzie, you're going into adulthood. 
And I know how tough that is. It's a very confusing, and it can even be a painful, hurtful time, even if you're not willing to admit that. Most people don't understand it, I do. Stay close to your father. He's a good father. Michelle, you're an adult. You have children of your own. Stay close to your father. He's a good man with a heart after God. Stay close to him. See, folks, the Pharisees missed it because to them, it was all about who they were. They got so close and they missed it. Maybe you don't have a father. Maybe your father wasn't a good father to you. Maybe your father did the best he could and it was still terrible. Maybe your father abandoned you. That was your earthly father. You have a heavenly father, and he is a good, good father. The first words of the Lord's Prayer are, Our Father, who art in heaven. John 1, 12 says, But to those who did receive him, he granted the authority to become God's children. Again, the Pharisees missed it because it was all about who they were, who people perceived them to be. Folks, it has nothing to do with who we are. And I'm going to ask the praise team to come up. It has nothing to do with who we are. It has everything to do with whose we are. Stay close to the Father. Don't miss it. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just... We thank you. We thank you so much. that well, The Word doesn't even say enough, uh, Lord. We just... Pray that you would just be, watch over us. The, pray that uh, you would just continue to feed us and bless us and guide us and protect us. And Lord, as we uh, try to just, we have nothing to give you except a heart full of praise, a fart, heart full of uh, hallelujah. So Lord, we just, once again, we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.